Um, what I would love is for those of you who are um, wallflowers, so to speak, if you can move up to the table. There, this is just the room set up, so there's nothing special about you sitting at the table. You're not going to be uh, quizzed. Uh, you know, we just want to make sure that we fill in the, the gap. So I love how compliant the women are. Okay. <laughs> this is something we're learning about, right, from Sheryl Sandberg, that uh, girls maybe follow the rules too much sometimes. Come on, boys, break, break the rules. It's okay. Um, we still have a few empty seats up here. All right. So I, th I think we're going to get started. My name is Margaret Anderson, and I am the executive director of Faster Cures. So Faster Cures, if you haven't already heard, I know that uh, we've talked about it a bit here at the conference. We're a center of the Milken Institute, and the Milken Institute is located here in Santa Monica. We're based in Washington, D.C., and we have existed for just about 10 years to really look at the medical research system and try to understand how it can move along more swiftly. Uh, we have a social media campaign called Time Equals Lives, and that is really you know, sort of the tagline, I think, for this conversation uh, that we have this morning. The title of this panel couldn't be more appropriately named, which is Impatient Patients, How Disease Organizations Are Accelerating Research. And we have uh, really a, a incredible lineup of people who have devoted you know, significant amounts of time and energy and mind share and passion to changing the world in their particular disease areas, but the ripple effects of what they're doing go well, well beyond that specific disease area. So whether it's the science that has, um, you know, sort of importance for other fields, or it's the model. That's what we're going to be teasing out today in our discussion. So the way that we're going to do this format is I will ask each of our panelists to uh, talk about the impatient patient within their particular disease area, and they can talk a little bit about their organizations. And then we'll have some uh, dialogue amongst the panelists, and since we're in kind of a little bit more of a, an informal setting, I'll open it up for conversation with all of you. But I would ask you to take really careful notes about the, the way that these individuals and their organizations are doing their work, because that's something that uh, I think has given a lot of optimism and hope in the medical research world, that these organizations that are embodied up here with me um, represent a relatively small amount of the total funding pie for biomedical research. But the important thing for you to know is that they have already been changing the world. And what we have witnessed at Faster Cures over the years is this intense focus on their organizational uh, sort of work and goals, but on this model. So if I could have um, slide number one, please. This slide really looks at venture philanthropy in medical research and what are the hallmarks of how these types of organizations do their work. If you turn to slide number two, what exactly is venture philanthropy? Uh, this slide will talk a little bit about that. Um, I, my favorite is the quote that says, it's philanthropy with an opinion. This is not about just throwing out um, seeds and seeing if they grow. These organizations are in a very targeted way trying to understand what's the problem that needs to be solved and then how can they and their philanthropic investment and in dollars make a difference. And I also like to point out that these groups, you know, they are out there fundraising in, um, you know, very significant ways, and it takes a lot of effort and energy. I'm sure all of them would agree. So they are not about wasting a penny of their resources because they want to basically put themselves out of business. So what I would like to do first is just kind of go down the line and ask our panelists to... Um, give us a flavor of that impatient patient role in their particular disease state. So on my uh, left is Lou DeGenero, and Lou is Executive Vice President and Chief Mission Officer at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Um, we have known Lou at Faster Cures for, for quite a while, and uh, that 
organization has been transforming the blood cancer space, but uh, you know, Lou has single-handedly been transforming the model within his own institution. Uh, it's an issue that, that's near and dear to my heart. As Lou knows, uh, my father died of leukemia, my brother-in-law died of leukemia, and uh, you know, he's doing his best, and so is the organization, to really try to end blood cancer. So Lou, with that um, ambitious introduction, tell us how you're going to do that and the role that patients play. Thank you very much, Margaret, and, and um, thanks also for being able to sit on this panel with this really esteemed group of people. Um, so, so I'll tell you a little bit about the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. We were founded uh, nearly 65 years ago by a husband and wife who lost their 22-year-old son to leukemia. And their view at the time was uh, more research needed to be done. Uh, they didn't ever want another family to experience the tragedy that they did. Um, the organization is still true to that, uh, the passion of that, uh, the, that husband and wife and to the goal of finding cures for the blood cancers. Um, I think the good news is we've made substantial progress since that time and there, uh, um, there are agents like uh, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, drugs like Gleevec that are, have been transformative not only for the lives of some blood cancer patients, but also in terms of changing the paradigm about how we think about treating cancer. Instead of using um, chemotherapeutic toxic agents, um, really using um, targeted agents that work in a completely different way. Uh, l let me scale it a little bit for you on the patient side. Uh, there are about 160,000 new diagnoses of uh, one of the blood cancers, leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, myelodysplastic syndrome, um, in North America um, each year. Uh, about a million North Americans currently live with the consequences of um, a blood cancer diagnosis. Um, about 140 of those patients will die each year, so it's a significant unmet medical need. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we've, while we've been, while research is the bow of the ship for the organization, uh, we also uh, have services to patients, education programs, support groups, financial aid for patients, and we're prosecuting a public policy and advocacy agenda as well that I want to come back to at the end because I think it's just as important as research. Uh, on the research side, uh, we've been funding research grants since uh, 1954. Um, between now and then, we funded nearly a billion dollars in research into the hematological malignancies. Uh, until uh, seven, six or seven years ago, those dollars went exclusively to investigator-initiated, um, to fund investigator-initiated projects in academic science, in academic institutions all around the world. Uh, we have no citizenship or geographic restrictions on where our dollars go. We're looking for the best science, the best medicine. Um, those programs were, the, we get about a thousand, just to scale it for you again, we get about a thousand applications a year. Those are peer reviewed through a very rigorous process. We end up funding 90 new projects a year and our research grant portfolio today is about 350 projects in academic centers, um, an investment of $60 million annually. Um, about five years ago, I put in place a program called the Therapy Acceleration Program because I saw some untapped value in our research grant portfolio. Um, I should tell you I have um, a, a background not only in academic science, but I worked in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry as well. And what I saw in our research grant portfolio were projects that, mo about 10% of the projects each year, 30 to 40 projects each year, would move um, in the grant portfolio out of basic research and into, I'm going to call it product development. So they moved into a space where they should be interacting with the FDA. They should be doing uh, IND enabling studies for the aficionados in the room. Um, and that kind of work is difficult to do in an academic environment. You can't get funding for it. It's applied science. It's not the kind of thing that um, an academic investigator gets tenure for doing. Um, uh, acad academicians don't understand the rules and regulations of the FDA. So we created the Therapy Acceleration Program first and foremost to harvest, harvest projects out of the grant program that had, had moved into product development and provide those investigators with the resources, the expertise um, to actually be able to move through the next steps of the FDA. 
Um, the program has taken on um, another initiative as well where we partner with small biotechnology companies. Uh, what we recognized was that there were companies that had um, therapies, drugs, um, that uh, might be active in the blood cancers but were not being developed for blood cancers. And they weren't being developed not for medical or scientific <laughs> reasons but largely for economic reasons. The, the blood cancer patient population, blood cancers are orphan diseases and the patient population um, was too small in theory to support the economic investment it would take for a company to, um, to develop a new drug in that space. Um, so we began to fund small biotechnology companies. We looked for companies with late preclinical and clinical stage assets um, that could be valuable in treating blood cancer. Um, we um, have deployed resources into those companies and again helped them move further down the product development pipeline. We don't have the resources to fully fund a drug development program. Our goal in partnering with these small companies has always been to get them over a critical development hurdle and hopefully put them in a position to be able to go to the capital markets um, or to, um, uh, to raise more money or to be able to find a partner in a big pharmaceutical or biotechnology company. Um, so that lays out what we're doing. Our goal always is new therapies for patients. M Margaret said it very well. We're trying to put ourselves out of business. Uh, we, we want to, uh, we, we envision, our vision is a world without blood cancer and we're working in, in a very concerted way to get there. Um, I, I want to end with just two um, successes, if you will. And, and you can think about successes in multiple ways here. I'll, I'll give you two ways to think about it. One is a patient-based success. Um, working together with both an academic investigator and then a small company, uh, we've recently been able to repurpose the active ingredient in a um, topical antifungal, so the active ingredient in a cream that's used, that's FDA approved to treat toenail fungus. We've been able to repurpose that for treatment of leukemia um, successfully. Um, and from a financial standpoint, um, last year, five of the small companies in our therapy acceleration portfolio saw um, third party deal flow. Um, they, there was an outright acquisition, three licensing arrangements, and an investment all made by the big pharmaceutical and big biotechnology interest, industry into those small companies. Um, we had deployed $17 million of LLS resources in our partnership with those companies. The, the uh, partnerships, the third party deals um, brought $500 million in cash um, to bear. So we leveraged our, our dollars 30 times. And if you believe in the out-year milestones, $1.7 billion in potential out-year milestones. So 100 times leverage on our investment. So Margaret, I'm going to stop there. Great. So Jonathan Simons, you are the CEO, the president of the Prostate Cancer Foundation, and you're doing your work on behalf of uh, sort of men around the world, really, that are either at risk for prostate cancer or um, you know, survivors of prostate cancer. I think that you and and through Mike uh, Milken's leadership have really transformed the you know the disease in a way in terms of the the spread of research opportunities that exist, but also um, you know putting men in terms of um, you know sort of being more aware of their risk and what they can do to be inpatient patients. Tell us about the the role that PCF plays in that prostate cancer <coughs> landscape and how how your model is set up to integrate that patient involvement in that voice and do some of the, you know, similar type things to what Lou just described in terms of really keeping your eye on the prize for research opportunity, talent, human capital. I gave you a tall order there. <laughs> but I know you can do it, Jonathan. I'll try. Can, I have a, kind of a what, a why, and a how for inpatient patients. It's a great topic. Um, the Prostate Cancer Foundation has in its, DNA, its organizational DNA a sense of urgency because the chairman and founder, Michael Milken, saw the field as needing an entire change. And since Ari Beldegrun, who's here, who I'll talk about in a moment, and all of us got really started to see venture philanthropy, the field really was a mess. Um, but what was projected was a death rate that's basically 40% higher than it is today. And a lot of that's a combination of a number of things, uh, but those projections were quite accurate. 
Uh, prostate cancer is the second most common cause of death in men after lung cancer. Um, men will die of prostate cancer every 17 minutes around the clock, 365 days a year. However, that being said, um, prostate cancer is diagnosed every three minutes around the clock in the United States of America, and prostate cancer has the largest number of patients who actually are told they have cancer but do not have the, a growth, it's more like a wart, which will not <laughs> actually cause them death in their lifetime, low-grade prostate cancer. So both problems in terms of putting prostate cancer in the history books like polio are a part of the research arm. So we try to, we try to take the inpatient patient and put it into the science, the partnerships. Um, we try to leverage the heck out of everyone else to do uh, advocacy and public policy so we can put everything into research in terms of the early stage of research. And you're right, Margaret, the, if I could just get one slide, we become more and more interested in four things for inpatient patients as the world has changed. One is, um, and this is a case study for a uh, paper that's impressed, one is to take an inpatient patient, that's John Willie, he's one of my patients from Johns Hopkins, who actually was a public advocate about his prostate cancer, who worked with others in Congress and President Clinton to give us the Department of Defense program, who participated in seven clinical trials on his course, went into four remissions with lethal prostate cancer, and tragically succumbed, um, but volunteered actually to participate posthumously because he was a Vietnam War veteran who was persuaded his prostate cancer came from Agent Orange. More about that after, if you'd like to talk about it. He actually volunteered um, in participating in all these clinical trials, not to be a guinea pig, because John would argue that there's no guinea here. There's great science coming out of the Prostate Cancer Foundation. These are some of the best scientific ideas at the moment, and it's a privilege to be a partner in my care. But I'm, I, I, I basically need the IRBs to work faster. We need the partnerships with the companies to come faster, because um, if something doesn't come faster, I will not be spending time with my grandchildren. Well, even posthumously, he signed up for a rapid autopsy. He had a beautiful uh, funeral we all attended. And basically, next slide, uh, you can keep there, go back one, it's okay. We've learned in doing whole genome sequencing with a thousand, basically the thousand dollar genome here and the 24 hour genome, we've actually learned in a case of John's why the final, um, why the disease became resistant to an important new medicine like abiraterone, why the disease actually became resistant to hormonal therapy, why the disease might be responsive, or disease like John's might be responsive to new classes of drugs that Dr. Beldegrun and others are, are developing. The point of this is that the inpatient patient in every aspect, there's no stage now in prostate cancer where science patients, patient activism, there, we don't look at Prostate cancer is a disease without, the, there's no stage beyond cure in our view now, although we had no new drugs when John Willie was diagnosed. We had no new drugs um, in 1992 for the entire disease when the foundation was created. But what we want to be doing is constantly trying to drive science in and out of every patient as a partner and then putting that out there in the public domain for biotech, for pharma, for academics. Because one of the more interesting aspects about John's memorial service was to also to celebrate all the science we learned in him. And that's a very unusual patient. And one of the things we've learned is that one of the key drivers for why prostate cancer kills men by getting into the bone and growing the bone like a termite is the same driver that's responsible for a significant numbers of deaths from leukemia. And so there's a confluence about making new drugs, but also Pa inpatient patients for one cancer can actually help cancer patients they'll never meet, not even with the same cancer, because some of the central biology is right. Um, the last piece about our inpatients, or empowering inpatient patients, is they have better ideas often than the doctors like me taking care of them. Because of Agent Orange, because Senator Stevens and Senator Kennedy, Senator Kerry, because there was a whole generation that remembered how awful Vietnam was, <laughs> That was the compelling argument for President Clinton to permit the Department of Defense to actually support, use Department of Defense money to support it. It was actually a patient experience. You'll hear from Gordon Gunn and others that it's these patient experiences that really elevate our society and make the most clever inves investments. It was Michael Milken's 
patient experience where time, um, time was so important not to waste that like Zeus with Athena coming out of his head, that creates faster cures. It was really the concept where time could be lives, we have to start working at time. So my message would be right now that we have um, a lot to do in terms of partnerships and all the rest, but there's no spectrum in any aspect of reducing the death rate to zero for prostate cancer where you can have patients as partners, public policy advocates, um, but also seekers of the very best state of science. Um, it's, and now with social media the way it is, and um, there's an opportunity for inpatient patients to continue to dominate the agenda, I think, um, for the best science, the best questions, no cutting corners in terms of, uh, including actually then volunteering if they choose to have their case evaluated for others. John's rapid autopsy um, and about 60 others have completely changed the landscape of potential new drugs. Um, so that's the last thing I would say about inpatient patients is they're probably one of the most important forms of heroism our country can manifest. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So, Jonathan, I know at Prostate Cancer Foundation, you all have a very robust social media program. How have you seen that evolve over the years in terms of this, uh, you know, empowered patient community talking to each other, sharing their experiences, knowledge, accessing your information? Have you seen that really kind of grow over the years? Um, there are two answers to that, yes and hell yes. Yeah. And I can't, we can't, we're not very well poised. We need new partnerships to try to understand but we have a demographic. Most men with prostate cancer um, are, in their f uh, are in their 60s or 70s. That's the nature of the disease. But what we've seen is the women that love them um, creating a very significant and expanding Facebook community. And we've seen social media become a really interesting marketplace um, for positive things like accrual to abiraterone, which is a very important FDA-approved drug um, that Dr. Beldegrun and colleagues found in Britain that got put in the prostate cancer clinical trials early through us. Um, so we think social media becomes a very interesting place to let the impatience turn into something positive. That being said, we're, we probably, as of the major biomedical research intensive foundations, we've spent the least, if you want to go to school on this, on any of this because we've been so um, feeling so urgently we need to fund more postdocs and young investigators. Our, our budget isn't proportionate right now to um, what could happen for social media. Right. So if anyone would be interested in helping us um, um, with how you would take it to another order of magnitude, um, we'd be very grateful to the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Most of it's been organic once you've created a community. Well, and, you know, I think the power of social media, we heard about it in a bioscience that will blow your mind panel that I just moderated before this. Um, the world is shrinking uh, and the challenges are still very large. I think the power of Facebook and things to share information and empower people to understand where they can at least go for information, um, you know, will just continue to grow. And I think it will only elevate the profile of that patient community and hopefully create more connectivity. Just the most um, remarkable thing, though, are the sons of the patients and families because Movember, which is a massive, it's like a MOOC, but we're out to sea. It's a massive online campaign around the world now in November for men's health. That's created a whole new dynamic of prostate cancer awareness. We're enormously grateful for our partnership there. But that gets into the whole question of public health and ultimately interdicting in prostate cancer. We can envisage with, we, can, we can see very soon with the new genetic understanding, whole populations of young men who their internist or their family doctor or even ultimately their pediatrician will be telling their mothers whose risk is so high um, they shouldn't actually get prostate cancer or their risk would be significantly reduced by changes in diet and lifestyle. And all that, Movember being the ultimate case study for men's health, but we think that there's a lot more possibility there. Um, and the irony of it is, that, which shouldn't be surprising, is that you know, the day before World War I broke out, the, the League of Nations, they weren't talking about um, 
all the cannons moving around and all the troops. They were talking about the cost of an airmail postage stamp. And the day before World War I broke out, that was the debate at the League of Nations, if you look back in history. And right now we have this amazing force for social media and awareness. And, um, and with enormous gratitude for my NCI grants and my Department of Defense grants, our government has not, in, in medical research, has not really said this would be the one moment in time to get everybody together that understands social media to basically activate large populations of patients at risk and patients on trial and actually try to get to patients um, high quality trials. You'd think that this would be about the smartest and most clever form of public policy. Um, so it's going to be up to the nonprofits, I think, just like um, the postage stamp right before World War II seemed to be the dominant issue. It's going to be up to nonprofits, I think, to keep pushing the social media uh, space towards getting inpatient patients the right trials, the right science, the right scientists, and actually the right health information. Well, and that was an interesting theme in this bioscience that will blow your mind panel with our uh, now 16-year-old panelist, Jack Andrika, who won the Intel Science Award. And, you know, he talked about it a little bit in the panel about ageism, but I, he's talked about it more in his interviews that uh, we need to, to quit, um, you know, sort of putting our views onto the younger generation of what we think they're capable of, uh, because he is clearly already, you know, doing dramatic things. Uh, and he sort of likes the internet because no one knows how old you are, you know, when you're there. There, there, there can be negative sides of that. But, uh, um, Gordon, I would like to turn to you next. As a successful businessman and, and a philanthropist yourself, you have been the co-founder and chairman of the Foundation for Fighting Blindness. Can you tell us a little bit about the return on philanthropy that you're seeking as you've been doing that work? And I'll put the microphone here to you. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Well, just, uh, excuse me. Yeah, just um, what I might do is just a little bit of background. Um, I lost my sight from a, a retinal degenerative disease known as retinitis pigmentosa back in 1970. And in the years leading up to it, as my sight was relentlessly degenerating, uh, I, I looked all over for ways to, to uh, treat it or stop the progress, even reverse it. And of course, there, there were non-scientific ways in those days, and uh, clearly they didn't work. But that, uh, when we formed the foundation in 1971, my wife and I and a handful of other families that had either children with the problem or other relatives, but or people themselves who had uh, one or another of these retinal degenerative diseases. Uh, we we uh, were strictly uh, based and dedicated on on a basic scientific approach to building the knowledge base about these diseases and about the retina first, in order that we could begin to uh, develop uh, treatments and cures for them. That was our driving goal. The diseases affect more than 10 million people in the United States. They include age-related macular degeneration and uh, retinitis pigmentosa, as I mentioned, Usher's disease. AMD, or age-related, is, is uh, macular degeneration, the leading cause of blindness for people over 55. So this is clearly going to become uh, an epidemic before, before long. When we started, uh, there was no knowledge to speak of about these diseases and almost no research going on. So we had to start from from uh, ground zero and really go from there and build build first of all uh, a, a, a number of uh, young investigators clinicians and also postdocs basic scientists uh, that we gave fellowships to and career development awards to to get them into the field to start with and then and then build from there and just going forward we now have uh, we've raised over five Five hundred and fifty million dollars, over a half a billion dollars of money over the last forty-two years, uh, all of it going towards research or building uh, this effort, and and we have forty-seven chapters around the country, probably one hundred and fifty thousand active donors and volunteers, patients, most of them, who are impatient, and and uh, and fortunately, after we got this critical knowledge base built, we began to have breakthroughs coming out of the laboratory. And of course, that's just the beginning. It's a wonderful thing to have. But you, to get, a, get these therapies ultimately to the patients, you have to go through translating that research from the laboratory to the clinic, and then on out to delivery to the patients themselves. So there's a whole pipeline of, of, um, of, of funding that's needed 
uh, for this uh, continuum of funding that's needed for starting with a very early stage basic science <coughs> and going all the way through to uh, delivery in the marketplace. And what we've tried to do is focus, first of all, on the early stage funding. I had been a venture capital a venture capitalist when, <coughs> when we started the foundation and so brought a number of the principles of that kind of investing to what we were doing with the foundation. And we started by, by bringing in these new investigators and innovative new research, getting them to a point where the, if they could prove out and have some traction, then the National Eye Institute, one of the National Institutes of Health, would, would pick it up from there and we'd get a lot of leverage out of that, which was terrific. Uh, and, then, and then we got to where, uh, about 10 years ago, translational research became very important. Uh, and and we, need, we set up a capability for doing that within the foundation, much like a number of the organizations represented here have a translational research capability, a chief drug development officer in, <laughs> on our staff and a business development person on our staff, so we could, so we could uh, move those, those breakthrough therapies uh, through and into the clinic and through what's called the valley of death. Well, in doing that, um, we found we have to come in at several points, so not just at the early stage venturing level, but then at, at the tr early translational work. And, and as some of these diseases, many of them are small market or, as you heard earlier, so-called orphan or rare diseases, uh, we have to squeeze more of the risk out uh, and, and, and that's what, why we, we spend a lot of time uh, trying to raise money to translate this research into, into the clinic and have this capability to do that. The return on investment has been huge. Uh, at long last, we, we have uh, several uh, therapies in the field that are based on work we did. Many of you may have heard of Second Sight's uh, Argus II, the so-called bionic retina. That was all based on uh, early uh, work that we funded to develop the technology back 15 years ago and longer and uh, and now happily that's that's to, and it's been it's been approved by the FDA will be available commercially it's a it's a, a, a electronic device an implant on the retina that's tied to a TV camera on your on the, on the frame of a pair of glasses uh, that can really help people with no sight or very little sight uh, have useful vision. In addition, uh, we've got, these are all genetic problems, the diseases we're working on. They all lead to severe visual impairment or blindness. Um, we have a gene therapy example that's just tremendously exciting. We're more than 50 young people and adults who have a disease, a very severe form of the disease I have, retinitis pigmentosa, it's called Leber's congenital amaurosis blind from birth, or they go blind early in, the, uh, in their lives. And uh, these, all of these patients were virtually blind uh, before the treatment. Uh, one gene, no, uh, normal gene replacement therapy, and they're now uh, seeing, and seeing in a very significant way. It's really a miracle. And, and, uh, and a platform for a lot more uh, gene therapy that's, that, that is in the works now. We have 12 clinical trials going on, also in stem cell therapy, also in pharmaceuticals, and the, and, the, uh, and the products that are already in the marketplace are, uh, one is a pharmaceutical and it's used by, Genentech has it, Lucentis, and there are new der derivations of that coming on that's based on, on the basic science work we funded some years ago. There's also some nutritional therapies that are slowing, significantly slowing the progress of some of these diseases. So right, right now we're at the point where I guess all of us could say the, the impatience is even greater because you can almost, you can almost feel it coming. It's pal palpable. So, Gordon, and I had a note passed to me by Jonathan, and he said uh, one patient, Gordon Gunn, created the modern eye research that the NIH now follows. And I think that you, as you've been talking, have uh, you know, sort of been the living embodiment of what this panel discussion is, in fact, about. I know that when the Foundation for Fighting Blindness uh, holds your fundraising dinners, you have a uh, unique tool to uh, really <coughs> pull people into the movement. Can you share with us what, what happens at these dinners? Sure. It's, uh, it's called d uh, Dining in the Dark, and, uh, and, it, and it means that you literally do that, but it's so, the darkness is so, uh, uh, so extreme. That is, there's no ambient light. 
that's all cut out. Some, in some cases, uh, a lower cost version of this is to put a mask over your face, which does the same thing. But, uh, but to have it in a room where it's totally dark or to have, have to eat a meal in the complete darkness is, is, uh, really brings home what we're, what we're trying to do. My wife, uh, who is a co-founder along with me and others of, of the foundation, said to me at the end of the first dinner, partway through it, she was across the table and she said, Gordon, is it really like this for you all the time? And I said, well, yes, it is. She said, if I'd known that, I would have been nicer to you. <laughs> So. <laughs> well, so Gordon, I, I keep meaning to come to one, and it hasn't worked. I feel like I need to sit at your table, though, to uh, well, you know, be able to have that conversation. You have with a standing you. invitation, Mark. So, thank you very much, yeah. Gordon. I I would like to turn now, um, Gordon, to your right is Deborah Black, and Deborah, uh, you are the co-founder and the chair of the Melanoma Research Alliance, and uh, I think you are also a living embodiment of what the power of of one individual and the power of someone who says. How can we uh, really start to address this problem? The Melanoma Research Alliance has really been at the forefront of some of the most exciting uh, breakthrough therapies that we've been seeing in, in science and cancer therapy. Take us on a journey with you of how you um, got to where you are right now with, with MRA in a very short period of time. Okay, well, thank you so much. It's great to be here today, and I see a lot of friends and family, and um, actually, we feel we're part family with the Milken Institute because from the very beginning, the Melanoma Research Alliance has been incubated with Faster Cures and the Milken Institute. Um, I am a melanoma survivor myself. I had stage two melanoma almost six years ago. It was sort of shocking because I had had a very early stage one and I saw the head of dermatology of a top institution. My husband's on the board. P.S. It was pretty shocking to learn uh, I had a very serious disease and the prognosis was not good. Mike Milken's a close friend of my husband, Leon's and mine. and. Um, Mike's own dad had died of melanoma, I guess, 35 years previous to my own diagnosis. And Mike basically said, with the help of Jonathan Simons at this panel, um, do you want to do for melanoma what I'm, I've done with prostate cancer? And Lee and I kind of looked at each other like, what do we know about running a disease-specific foundation? But um, when you care a lot about something, you learn. And we've had incredible support from Mike Milken, from um, Margaret, Jonathan, so many people in this room and everywhere. And basically, part of the challenge for us, and I've been so blessed that I've had no health issues. I always have to knock, knock would when I say this because one never knows. None of us ever know, obviously, with any disease. And there's so many diseases here at the table we're discussing. But the key point I would like to make with melanoma, which is unique, I think, is if you are aware of melanoma and you have body checks, 95% of the time it's no big deal. And most people, and really bright, intelligent, educated people, as well as people who maybe don't know as much about disease, will say to me, you can, is melanoma really serious? Don't you just cut it out? And I'm like, well, if you're lucky, yes. But sadly, um, we're quoting statistics, somebody dies in the U.S. every hour from melanoma. And it's a disease that, if caught early, is so avoidable. So we're a young organization. We started really almost five and a half years ago um, when Mike, uh, when I was diagnosed and I was so lucky to have his guidance visiting the top specialists throughout the world, basically they all said to me, well, um, you know, you have to do this and that. And I said, okay, I understand, but if it's, you know, if I get a recurrence, if it spreads, then what happens? And they all looked down at their feet. I saw six specialists, and it dawned upon me, I have four children, that there was a real risk. I wouldn't watch my kids grow up. And that was terrifying um, on every level. So anyhow, we decided that we're going to try to change the landscape for melanoma so people don't have to suffer and die from this disease. And unlike a lot of disease, it's a kind of two disease 
because, well, I guess with prostate cancer, it's the same with young men and old men. It's, uh, but with melanoma, early stage, no big deal. Late stage, terrible, terrible prognosis. And one of our missions, besides funding late stage disease, so there are options for patients, is also to educate, it's epidemic of the young people, the tanning beds, kids are crazy. They're by the college campuses and they don't realize you have a 75% greater chance of getting melanoma if you're a regular tanning bed user. Use a spray tan. Um, there's so many ways to avoid putting yourself at risk. There are no guarantees in anything, but it's been really a wonderful opportunity to have, it, I think as a patient, it makes you feel so much more in control if you're trying to do something instead of just like, what can I do? We all can do something. And so now the Melanoma Research Alliance has really been about funding research and every penny we raise and we all fundraise goes directly to research because my husband and I fund all expenses of the organization. And I think what we've tried to do as an organization is educate, but also because we are a young foundation, use the example of so many of the people sitting around this table and what's the best in class? The Robin Hood Foundation, they fund all the expenses. You know, how can you get the most bang for your buck? How can you co fund with other foundations and all stakeholders in the field. And I just would like to bore you, I hope not, but show you three slides that kind of exemplify some of the things we're trying to do because of course we've reached out and fundraised and the research is there. I just want to say Sid Mukherjee is a friend of mine. He wrote the book, The Emperor of All Maladies. And in it, he says, when Nixon declared the war on cancer, we had the money, but we didn't have the science. Today, we have the science. We're getting there. As we all are talking about, you can taste it. We're more impatient than ever because we know people don't have to suffer and die or be blind or do these disease for long because I believe there's real opportunity. So I would urge everyone to reach out to their congressmen and senators and whatever relationships they have and beg them to end the sequestering because it's really going to kill the research and all the young people who we work so hard to get into this field and focus, in our case, melanoma, but any disease. But also I think you have to, what we're doing at least, and I think many people around the table, is work with everybody who's a stakeholder in the field. So I would ask you to put up uh, slide 12, please. And in slide 12, on slide 12, you'll see two of the things the Melanoma Research Alliance has done quite successfully. One is a dream team with Stand Up to Cancer and using their enormous relationships to advertise and bring the word that melanoma can be caught early and get celebrities on board to give that message. Giada De Laurentiis and uh, Laura Linney have been spokespeople. Then we did a unique um, partnership with L'Oreal. Um, L'Oreal is all about healthy skin is beautiful skin. And we reached out to them and we have just launched a partnership where for every product of this Sublime Sun, which is an SPF sunblock without paraffin and a good one, but I'm not endorsing any, um, our CEO is here, so I'm not endorsing, I'm just educating. But I want to point out that for every brand, a dollar, for every Sublime Sun sunblack sold, a dollar will be donated during the month of May to the Melanoma Research Alliance. We're in 3,000 stores with this product across the country, and there's going to be the ABCDEs of melanoma to educate people about the dangers. We're particularly, because of L'Oreal, part of their target audience is going after people of color because they are the most underserved part of the community. People assume because their skin's darker, they can't get melanoma. Incorrect, Bob Marley died of melanoma. Um, and finally, I'll end with uh, slide 14, please. 
and it's something we're very proud of. And that is um, we have a um, partnership, but more than a partnership, we're very much part of the Danny's Fund, which is in honor of Danny Federici, who was with the E Street Band at Springsteen, who died of melanoma. His wife, his widow, unfortunately, widow, not wife, currently, um, Maya is here, Stendhal, and we're so proud. Today it's launching, and we're doing a texting campaign in honor of Danny Federici, and um, we've been able to do text Danny. I don't know the number exactly here. It's text Danny 50555, and with the $10 donation, which um, I forgot which phone operator, but they waived it for us, um, the charge, all the money will be going to fund melanoma research in honor of Danny Federici at Sloan. So again, we're working very hard with everybody out there, be it pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, multiple myeloma, because we share so many pathways and drugs work for other disease. The anti-PD-1 that we have spent a lot of money funding has shown incredible robust results for lung cancer. So I think it's in these very difficult times for research, incredibly important for all of us to work together. So thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I um, I think you gave you know one of the most eloquent um, sort of speeches that I've heard recently about the relevance that all of you in the audience play right now with public policy and biomedical research funding. So I think Deborah, we're going to start calling you Senator Black from the state of New York because I, I think we could use some of that passion in Washington. Um, I think that you clearly got a flavor of some of the, the work that MRA has been doing in a very, very short period of time. I'd like to turn to our, our next panelist, John Walsh. And John is someone that uh, we got to know pretty quickly when we first start, started to uh, stand up Faster Cures. He is the co-founder, president, and CEO of the Alpha One Foundation. And I can tell you, John is a true inspiration to me and to everybody that he gets a chance to work with, uh, has a sort of a quiet passion and force that really the uh, NIH has taken notice of. I know you received an award um, at some point for this. Dr. Elias Zerhouni used to talk about you and your work a very long time ago. And, and one other point that I'll throw in, John, before you go, which is that uh, we both found out recently that we are using the Fitbit to track our steps. And I very proudly said, I, I'm trying to do 10,000 steps a day. And John kind of just quietly said, oh, I'm up to 20,000 a day. And as you'll be hearing from John, uh, who has COPD, um, that means a whole lot. So I came back to the office and said, all right, we all have to step it up a little bit. So John, tell us what you're doing at Alpha One and COPD and how you believe the patient uh, plays a significant role in all of this. OK, thank you, Margaret. It's really an honor to be here with, with our Faster Cure colleagues. And we We've really benefited as an organization and as a community for being part of Faster Cures uh, since inception, actually. So um, I, I became an inpatient patient in February 1989 when I was diagnosed with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is a genetic condition that causes a dysfunction at the liver cell level, doesn't secrete a protein that protects the lung. So most of us present with early onset emphysema between 35 and 45 years old. 5% of our population present with liver failure at birth. So it's a second reason for liver transplantation in infancy and a major reason for liver transplant transplantation in adults and also lung transplantation. My twin brother called me up. We had been, we had been symptomatic at 35 and shared stories over the phone with pneumonias, bouts of hospitalizations, and various exacerbations. And uh, he said, I've got good news and bad news. I said, give me the good news. The good news was we knew it was alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, this genetic condition. We can do something about it. There'll be information out there. There'll be therapies we can take. There'll be things we can do. Uh, there was none of that, actually, except for one. And, uh, and the bad news was, and I, I said, you don't have to tell me the bad news, is what mom died from when she was when 46 and we were 13. So three of four siblings in my family have a severe form of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Freddie's on full-time supplemental oxygen on a transplant list with less than 17% of normal lung function. He smoked and had ex environmental exposures. I didn't. 
I have about 34, 35% of normal lung function, have to use oxygen at altitude when I fly. And my sister uh, uses uh, oxygen at, at altitude as well now. So alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency was our awakening, and we became very impatient immediately. Freddie and I immediately joined a, 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 a longitudinal disease progression study that the NIH was doing, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which was a phase four requirement for the approval of the first orphan drug for lung disease, uh, a, a plasma protein that basically augments the protein that's not secreted from our liver. So we infuse weekly and have infused weekly since we were diagnosed uh, with this plasma protein. And, uh, and that certainly, we believe, has helped extend our lives. Uh, when the NIH said in 1994 that they were not going to uh, our, our whole community was created around this longitudinal study. So support groups started forming where the clinical research centers were. There were 32 of them around the country. We created an association was, as a result of that for patient advocacy, support, and education. When the NIH told us in 94 that when the study was over, they weren't going to fund any more research, where they actually purified the protein at a lab at NIH, and it was commercialized under the Orphan Drug Act. Um, we realized that we had to take over ourselves, and we're, that was unacceptable that they weren't going to continue to do research. Getting stuck every week and not knowing whether it really worked or not uh, was not acceptable to our community. So we started the Alpha One Foundation to uh, provide the leadership and resources to increase research, improve health, promote worldwide detection, and cure Alpha One. And in that context, we had less than 2,000 people diagnosed at the time, and how are you going to fund a cure? How are you going to fund research in a meaningful way? So we created uh, AlphaNet, a not-for-profit health management company with a primary objective of providing comprehensive health management to individuals with Alpha-1 to improve the quality of our lives and also to develop a recurring source of revenue to support research. And we have uh, some 35, 36 uh, peer health coaches that are that are trained and cross-trained in health management, not to give medical advice, but to help coordinate care. Uh, they provide 24/7 services to somewhere between 120 and 150 alphas themselves. A, a majority of the people on augmentation therapy, this the therapy we take, are covered under the AlphaNet umbrella, and we've been able to substantiate through outcomes trials since 1999. Uh, th that we can actually Im improve the quality of somebody's life and get them active and engaged in their care. In fact, we have a 98% adherence rate to our weekly IV therapy. You can't get 30% with an oral drug or a meter dose inhaler. So we're very proud of the, the program. It works well. We've got a good clinical core. The foundation, the AlphaNet's recurring revenue capabilities has provided over $35 million of support uh, to the Alpha One Foundation to support our research mission. And as a result, we were able to create the infrastructure to support research on an international scale. So we've got the largest registry in the world of individuals with Alpha One. We can recruit for a phase three pivotal study, clinical trial, in six to eight weeks with a, with a disease with, with uh, much less than, with about five, five to 7,000 uh, diagnosed now, which is unheard of in the rare disease space and certainly unheard of in the chronic disease space where you have millions of patients. So that's been very effective for us to be able to get three new drugs approved and, and be able to attract the investment of biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies and other therapeutic strategies. Um, we've, we've also, with, with our research program, have the largest uh, repository of DNA in alpha-1 specific tissue. As a result of participating in a clinical research, a translational research lab and a genetics reference lab you know, that's international and supports the international investigator community, <coughs> as a result of coming out of the NIH, we really evolved from that NIH study. You know, we've embedded in our culture of our community to participate in clinical research so we can, people understand that they need to step up. Up and for our next generation and with a familial disease with a genetic condition, it's about our, our kids and our grandkids, not necessarily about us. So that's been very effective and we've been able to fund $47 million at 96 institutions in North America and Europe uh, since we started funding research in 1999. Uh, three years ago, we, some of these scientists that we, we invested in basic science 
had, had uh, identified therapeutic uh, pathways and some, some specific compounds that we wanted to investigate, and they couldn't do that in an academic environment. So we, we took the, the lead that, that, Lou, that Lou and Jonathan have done and, and, uh, and Bob Bell at CF, and we created a wholly owned for-profit subsidiary of the foundation called the Alpha One Project. The project has an end to invest in, in biotech in, in advancement or acceleration of therapeutic development to take those discoveries that were made as a result of the basic science we funded and, and get it to therapy, get it available for patients. And we've made our first three investments. One of the investments is to a company, AGCT, which is doing gene therapy. And we've funded them with over $1.5 million previously, starting with getting their vector lab validated. Uh, in, 19, in, in 2000, and we just gave them a $350,000 kind of softball grant to help them raise $37 million with a venture group, which uh, they attributed to the, to the support we've given them and our ability to recruit successfully in advance of a projected timeline uh, individuals to participate in five clinical studies with gene therapy. John, I, I wanted to ask you, so you, you've laid out the incredible business case of how your organization and really I think what you've been hearing from each organization is how these groups are de-risking the science and creating opportunities so that research can be accelerated. You talked very much about your patient population having to be uh, sort of at the ready. When, when they're called to serve, as Jonathan pointed out, you know, they're ready to go into clinical research. I, I wanted to, to open it up to the panel, though, to ask a question about, you know, anyone who's in this room who is either a patient today or will be a patient or you have them in your lives, this is going to be videotaped and put on the web. What advice do you all have for people out there, whether they're affiliated with your particular disease or not, how can they um, kind of create that same sense of engagement and productivity that all of you have? What, what advice do you have for them? So, John, if you want to take that first, and we'll ask each I panelist think, to speak I on that. I think work with other people um, with the same condition and family members and whoever will listen, including the scientific community, to inform, educate, empower, and engage individuals to participate in clinical research and support clinical research. If we don't do it, nobody else is. Others that want to weigh in on that? I've got the mic over here. Um, so what I'm about to say might be a little heretical, but it's not always about more money. I actually think it's more about alignment, understanding um, the whole ecosystem. So you've got academic research, you have biotech and pharma, the Food and Drug Administration, third-party payers, patients. Um, alignment around, uh, alignment of those constituents um, and, and the voluntary health agency can make that happen. They're in a unique position to really make that happen. A alignment of the constituents um, and the definition of a project and uh, of, a, of a pathway and the creation of a strategy can make you far more effective in deploying the dollars that you have. So again, I don't think the answer is always more money. Uh, I think it's having that strategy and understanding who the players are. Um, I did want to mention, I mentioned policy and advocacy in the past. Um, we heard a lot about the groups represented here funding research, and it's critically important. But if a uh, breakthrough can't get through the FDA, uh, we haven't done our jobs. And if patients don't have access to the breakthrough because they can't afford it, if, it, if it's not reimbursed, we haven't done our jobs. So I, I think there needs to be an equal emphasis on uh, policy and advocacy <coughs> to be certain that, that the FDA is well positioned to evaluate and potentially approve new therapies, and the third-party payers are in a place to reimburse them. Gordon, would you like to weigh in? Oh, excuse me. Yeah, that came, well, that's all right. Uh, I, I, I think another very important thing, we, we, when we started, we very soon realized it wasn't just being able to raise the money, and that continues and always will be very important because now there's much more research uh, out there that looks very promising than, than there is money to fund it, and especially with the high cost of clinical trials. But I, I think people power is huge in all of these diseases. The more people that can get behind it, let, uh, let the researchers know that what they're doing isn't just about uh, getting, 
getting their peer recognition from in an academic sense or getting NIH funding. It's also all about the patients and what ultimately the research is all about, which is finding treatments, cures, and prevention. So the more people get involved and mobilized and help get behind not only organizations like those represented here or that are, <laughs> exist for other diseases, but the more they get vocal about it and bring their passion to bear, the more is, is going to happen. So both uh, Jonathan and Deborah, your organizations convene uh, scientific or, you know, meetings where you bring together the science communities. How is it for those science communities to interact directly with the patients the way that uh, Gordon just described? Well, I, I think it's twofold. Um, we've had we've had our sixth retreat this year, and um, it's an incredible opportunity for the science to kind of um, kind of talk off the record in a sense to see what the other person might be doing, how what didn't work is often important and as important as what did work so you don't waste more time on things that aren't good or had one improve absorption in the trial. There's so much that you learn like a, it's interesting like we're at this um, Milk and Global. I think so much what goes on outside of the panels is equally interesting as to what actually goes on in the presentation. The other thing I would like to mention which I think is so important and it keeps coming up and that is our goal has been to get the best and brightest to want to work in melanoma. It had previously been a really dead-end field. It, there was no funding and people just the best and brightest would go where the funding is. It makes the most sense. And what's been particularly rewarding for us, I think, is to have gotten so many brilliant scientists from all over to put proposals in. And maybe they're spending 5% of their time on melanoma, but that research is helpful in so many other disease. And so you don't know, like, the uh, anti, well, this IPI drug that was funded really initially by research in prostate cancer, but had much more robust results in melanoma, is now go the next generation anti-PD-1 is useful for lung cancer, very useful. So it's exciting to think that there's so much cross-pollination. So. So I'm getting the, the time signal here. If you could just put up slide number eight. I encourage all of you to take a look at the Faster Cures website. We have something called TRAIN, which is a network of these different disease research organizations where they can share best practices. And we're constantly putting new information up there. Uh, I think one of the incredible hallmarks of this movement of these groups is that they don't want anyone else to waste time or money uh, you know, trying to fix things that they've already taken care of. And so they are constantly out there open sourcing, learning from each other, and, and doing back and forth sharing at the infrastructure level as well as at the scientific level, as Deborah just articulated. So I really want you to join me in thanking this uh, tremendous group that we have here for this panel. Everybody, you, uh, if you're going to lunch, uh, I hope that you're going to report for duty. We have more science and prevention coming your way.